Hi, my name is Ella Wakatama. Welcome to this FAIN online event celebrating the 2024 shortlist of the Commonwealth Writers' Prize. I'd like to introduce you to our shortlisted writers. The regional winner for Africa is Rina Usha Rungu. Rungu is a Mauritian writer, scholar, teacher, speaker, and mother. As an islander, an African, and a diasporic South Asian, she uses the language of fiction to speak on how colonial violence infiltrates our beings, our languages, and our desires, and on the creative ways in which we resist. She is assistant professor at Harvard University. The overall winner of the prize and the regional winner for Asia is Sunjana Takur. Sunjana has a degree in English and Anthropology from Wellesley College and is currently pursuing an MFA in Fiction at UT Austin Writer New Writers Project. Her short story Backstroke was published in the Southampton Review. She is from Mumbai. The regional winner for the Caribbean is Portia Suban, a writer and ink artist from Trinidad and Tobago. Her stories are inspired by her parents, her parents' tales of colonial and early post-colonial Trinidad, lived experience, and old talk gathered through the years. She is the winner of the 2019 Cecile de Jong Literary Prize from the Caribbean writer, University of the Virgin Islands, for her short story, Twice the World, and the 2016 Small Acts Literary Short Story Competition for Mango Feast. She is published in Free Tree Magazine and the Caribbean Writer. The regional winner for Canada and Europe is Julie Bouchard. Julie is a native and resident of Montreal and has released the collections of short stories and the novel over the last decade with La Plaine Lune, a Quebec-based publishing house. She was awarded the Radio Canada Short Story Prize in both 2020 and 2021. She currently works in academic publishing. And finally, the regional winner for the Pacific is Pip Robertson. Pip has had short stories published in journals and anthologies in print and online. She holds an MA from the International Institute of Modern Letters at Te Harangawaka, Victoria University of Wellington. She lives in Te Wanganui Atara, Atawera, New Zealand, with her partner, daughter and dogs. I personally want to start with the congratulations and the thank you. These are amazing stories and one of the strongest shortlists I've seen in a long time. So I'd like to welcome um, Rina, Sanjana, Portia and Julie and Pip to the conversation this evening. Um, welcome to all. Um, I'd like to start off by by sort of discussing something that struck me as I was reading the story, that in each and every one, I found not only the challenge of entering a new point of view that demanded a lot from me, but I thought to myself, these stories could all in some way be um, classified as uh speculative. They're things that happen that we maybe don't see in every in everyday life and the observations that are made that seem to kind of speak to a spiritual world or a past history. And I just wanted to ask each and every one of you about the storytelling traditions that you're coming out of, out of, where, you know, to give you an example, whereas something may be seen as realism in an English sense. For me as an African, it's a very different kind of realism because the ancestors are involved. So I wonder if I could maybe, let's start alphabetically. Um, let, um, Julia, can you talk to us a little bit about the storytelling traditions that inform your own work, but in specific, the story, what burns? And perhaps you can start with a sentence or two telling us what the story is about. Yes, so the story is, the story is about uh, many fires that took place last year in the summer of 2023. So I was inspired first by the wildfires in the boreal forest that left a deep impression on me. And after that, I saw fires everywhere. And from that, well, I elaborated the story where fires is almost everywhere. So um, 
the tradition, I, I guess I must say that here in Quebec, we, we live in French, but we live mm -hmm. in a sea of English people. So we are, I think we are at the junction of uh, the European world and also the American world. And I'm sure this has um, an effect on how I write, how we write the stories, because there's um, the two, the two uh, pole attraction between this European style and American style. Mm -hmm. That's very true. But I, I also found elements because in the end, the story with the fires, Initially, I thought of all of the international conflagrations going on right now, the various wars. That really spoke to me. So it felt immediate. Um, it's disturbing. And then it's also funny at times, which kind of was a challenge for me. Um, and I, I wondered about that balance. How do you make something so serious and so dire? And how do you inject humor into it? Yeah, that, well, in fact, that's what I like. I like to have um, a, a topic that is really serious, but into that to put to try to put some humor in it. So I guess um, a author I like is Romain Gary. He does that. A, a lot, I think a lot of um, writers try, try to do that. Maybe um, Philip Roth, um, George Saunders, who I who I love. And um, Flannery O'Connor, well, in fact, I won't uh, name too much yeah. uh, authors, but yeah, you, you know what, what I mean, just to try to to um, to to load attention a little bit. Yes. Um, one of the things I, th I think about when you talk about the French and the English influences is also thinking about the, the number of immigrants from all around the world mm -hmm. that live in various Canadian countries, but also so the native populations, do you feel that those voices have an influence on your writing as well? Yes, a lot. In fact, Montreal is really multicultural and um, there's a lot of writers here. Uh, we have um, Asian, of course, Japanese, uh, well, people all around the world that are so um, well known here and whose literature we, we love. So of course, I, I guess it must have an influence on me, the Jewish people too. Uh, Montreal is really um, a, a melting pot of all cultural, um, um, yeah. And I think that- really I, I must say, I'm it. sorry. I, I, no, I just want to say that I would like to express myself better, but it would be better in French, but I'm sorry for that. I think we all got your meaning very clearly. Thank you very much for that. Um, um, Sanjana, I'd like to move on to you. Yours was the winning story. And I saw the title and I immediately had a face in mind. And <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your story. It has one of the most arresting beginnings I've read in a long time. And if we're speaking about this kind of realism. It, it struck me that your story is, I guess, you know, genres can be useless because you're, just, you're telling a story. But from the very first sentence, the reader knows they're going to have to have a shift in perspective. Tell us where the story came from, especially for those of us who are fans of cinema from, from, from Asia, from India especially. Yeah, I uh thank you firstly. That was that's very kind. Um I love Bollywood and I love Ashwari Rai and um she seemed to fit into the story very naturally. So I'm I'm happy she she made it in there. Um, the story, the idea of the story began just because I have this fascination with mother-daughter relationships. Um, I'm one of two daughters. I have a younger sister. And so I see that relationship unfold in different ways in my own home. And I think that no matter how how wonderful or good of a relationship you have with your mother, that relationship feels like it has to be complicated um, in a lot of ways because of what mothers and daughters expect of each other, but also of what <clears throat> society expects of, of mothers, of daughters, and of women. Um, and so I've been really interested in that relationship for several years. Um, all of the stories I've, I wrote for my MFA um, have been about mothers and daughters. And this story emerged at a point where I was really frustrated with myself. And I was 
I, I kind of wondered if I would ever be able to write anything else, if I would ever be able to write something that wasn't about mothers and daughters. And so I think out of that frustration, I thought, okay, let me write a story in which I pack in as many mothers as possible. And maybe after that, I could finally move on to something else. Um, the moving on didn't work, but I do think that this story ended up being a really a really fun and I, I, I hope really constructive way to think about the different iterations of that relationship and what that looks like um, for different people. And then of course, Eshwari Rai, I think exists in the public imagination as kind of an ideal woman. Um, and because so much of the story is about striving and falling short of that level of womanhood, uh, I, I was looking to incorporate someone who was who who seemed to have achieved that that level of perfection um and thinking about how how advertising and consumerism and capitalism and celebrity worship culture all impact the ways that women see themselves and see each other love the way you articulate that and it's not just that the protagonist is looking for a mother she's she's actually looking for herself I yeah. felt you know in in all of these I I particularly enjoyed the fact that um one of the mothers basically says yeah this isn't for me <laughs> and 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 Lisa so that sense of duty you kind of upend upend that sense of duty but you also I think really pinpoint an idea of mother's work as in things that we take for granted as you know this is what a mother does I think what your story did for me was really pinpoint that that this is work I wonder if you could read to us for a couple of minutes from your story and depending on where you are give us a tiny bit of context yeah, absolutely. I think I'll just read from the beginning, if that's okay. Please, yes. Mm -hmm. The first mother Avni brings home is too clean. She wears white at all times, perpetually a mourner, and roams the two-bed flat with a feather duster tied to her slim wrist. Don't I look just like Eshwarya Rai, she asks, and pours bleach into the bathtub and onto her body. Scrub-a-dub-dub. Avni asks her no questions and takes her straight back. At the shelter, they lead her to the back and shoot her. She's had multiple placements, they explain. Sometimes this is the humane option. The second mother is mean and very, very beautiful. This one actually does look like Eshwari Rai, Avni thinks, a star. She buys a weighing scale and makes Avni stand on it and watch the numbers wobble. Too high, she decides when they steady. Let's play a game, Avni says, stepping off the scale. She crosses her arms over her body and watches as she shrinks in the mirror. Would you rather have a fat, happy daughter or a daughter who is thin and sad? The second mother doesn't hesitate. Thin. And sad. Yes, she agrees. Avni nods. How do you sleep? Too well, she confesses, like a baby. The shelter people take her back, no problem. She has a highly desirable look, they say, and will find another home quickly. And does Avni want to take another look around? Should I stop there or do I? Have some that's, a great, that's a great place to stop. I have to say that as the mother of two adult women, the idea of being able to be returned to the shelter and shot terrified me because I'm sure my daughter's a thought of it but um I thought it was a really brave story packed with so many ideas just really really wonderful did you have fun writing think, it I had a lot of fun writing it I don't think my mother liked that bit either I have to say um but I had a lot of fun writing it and I think this is the story that made me accept um my obsession I think I, I decided that if this is what I want to write and I can keep writing it in interesting ways, then I'm just going to keep doing that until I, I until I run out. I think that's excellent because some of my favorite writers are writing the same subject over and over again in new ways. And I, you know, it's it's wonderful following that exploration. Thank you so much for that. I'd like to move on to you, Portia. 
um, to talk about the, the devil's son. Um, as with all of these stories, I, I really enjoyed it. And for me, it was a, a very poetic story. And there was this really strong sense of both the past and the present as you as you live through this. But what I want to talk to you about first is about language and thinking about um, crafting an authentic voice that also has to be universal because you want you want all of the readers to be able to read it. So, Portia, can you talk to us a little bit about the, your, the choices you had to make with language in your story? Um, well, thanks for those words on my story. Um, with language and coming from the Caribbean, where we have, you know, so many cultures coming in that would have contributed to our language. So we would have um, actual like like French, Spanish, um, Hindi influences. So it's kind of like a mod podge of things coming in. Um, but I think think when you're writing and you don't want to explain too much which I think is where the authenticity comes in you have to really embed the unique words into context so mm -hmm. um so I think uh when I was trying to sort that one out in my head um I was reading a book called Limbo Lost by Robbie Arnott and while I was reading it, there were a lot of little words I didn't like figure out as much because he talks about like a lot of flora and fauna. And I would be like, what wait, what is this? And then afterwards he would describe the food or something, and I'd be like, Oh, it's a food. So in the same way, I was thinking with language that you don't want to explain too much. The you have to give the reader, um, you know, you have to think, yeah, the reader is smarter than this. So um, instead, you do it in a way that my words become, you know, placed into a context that you are familiar with and that you understand. And um, I really enjoyed doing that. We have, um, in our local dialect, we have so many unique words and putting them in was fun. We have, um, like, a lot of French words as well that three years of um realization they have different pronunciations so um there's loup garou which I believe is French for um like werewolf we call it a so uh -huh. um so all these things um I think it's really fun and interesting with our language and even um the dialect grammar we have um we have different forms of grammar it's not it's not standardized but it's things that people see and different parts of the country have um different different grammar that they would use so I found that persons um who live more south of the country or um who had ancestors who were cane cutters they would they would say instead of I had to tell you they would say I had was to tell you so all these yeah. things to make sure that it was there, you know, and you would understand that these persons come from a particular part of Trinidad or a particular time of Trinidad, because I only hear people over 60 saying I had was to tell you. So um, you wouldn't gather that immediately as an international audience, but it was really gratifying the messages from fellow Trinidadians telling me how how much they loved reading a story in the same language that they think in that it was very immediate to them so I really like I that think, yeah and I think even for the reader who's not familiar to it it feels like discovery um it did make me think a lot about sort of the the history of the place because we have I think it's Beta who refuses to be tamed if 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 I'm correct the devil's son um, himself and then we have the Anglican corpses I won't I won't give too many spoilers but for me there was a real sense of sort of history memory and perhaps the the legacy and burden of colonialism it's all worn very very lightly. 
But at the same time, you know, given that this is a common law of prize, I think it's it's worth talking about because I felt that the story was was speaking to it. And so the fact that you had a creature that refused to be tamed and everyone else had to work around it felt to me like a really important message. I just wonder, what, what do you think about that reading? Were those things in your mind at all as you were writing? Well, I guess not immediately, uh, because at first I um, I just wanted to write about scenes that my dad used to tell me about. And he has all these paintings about colonial Trinidad. And um, there was one painting he did of the bisons being tamed. And they were, same thing as in the story, um, the bison, they were done in pairs. They would be pulling at logs or at um, the buttress of a silk cotton tree. And he was telling me the story of this one bison. They couldn't, he couldn't be tamed. And he almost killed a person. And my dad was just describing it to me. And I was like, what did they do with him? What did they do with that bison who cannot be tamed, who refuses to work, refuses to pull all the carts of sugar cane and all of that? Um, who, who refuses to plow the plow, to plow the land for all of this, you know, monoculture to take over because the entirety of Trinidad, most of it was sugarcane. And um, this one person, well, this one entity refuses to go through with it. What is his afterlife like? You know, and interestingly enough, someone just wants to keep him around and let him do as he wishes, which I think might really happen in real life but I wanted to give him that I wanted to give him that status that when even though he refused to do as he is supposed to do he is still allowed to live this sort of free life and doing what he wants to do and the name as well um Beta is well it's Hindi for son and we do have a lot of um like still a lot of Indian influences in my country and I remember growing up one of my cousins his mom would always call him beta come and eat this come and get that a real kind of what we call baby up so I that is why I gave him that name because I wanted him to be babied up even though he's not obeying or anything so it was more it was more on that side but I really appreciate what um your interpretation of it it's very good I loved that you, in this very hard life that you're describing, you allow one creature absolute freedom that's that's protected. I That felt very special to me, especially the way that you did that. I'm going to, I will ask you to read, but I want first to move on to Rena. Um, Rena, just carrying on this idea of coming from a place that's influenced by so many different cultures and... Um, I wondered, um, Rena, if you could talk to us a little bit, as, as I asked um, Julia, about the different storytelling, either techniques or traditions or the, the different people who told you stories that made you a writer and um, also the kind of writer that you are. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that question. Um, I think there are so many ways to answer this question. I'm going to try to cover it all. Stop me if I'm, you know, going on for too long. Um, I think, first of all, um, there are many women writers in Mauritius that are very influential for me. Um, um, uh, at the same time, I think there's a way in which I've never seen, you know, my community, my class, my type of point of view represented. Um, that I think in that way they influenced me too, you know, they pushed me. Well, they, they they made me see that as a Mauritian woman, I could write, you know, I could be a writer. At the same time, I think, um, you know, working class Mauritian, Mauritius is often represented by people who don't actually come from that background. Yes. And I think this yes. is something, you know, I wanted to rectify yes. 
And of course, this is very complicated because I do come from a working class background, but I'm not working class anymore. So just um, as I'm seeing my country from a certain distance and perspective, I'm also seeing where, where I came from, right? From, from, from a distance. Mm -hmm. well. um, so I think in terms of influences, that's one of them. And then um, I think another thing is, you know, um, like Trinidad, Mauritius is also, you know, was colonized for a long time and you have like sort of different cultures coming in coming in as well um for me I think that, that the whole you know I mean I'm, I'm also a scholar I'm not just a writer and for me it's not that contradictory as a scholar I talk a lot about colonialism um and it's a strange thing to talk about it to to, to students or you know write about it in a paper with that sort of mantle of objectivity when I'm a product of it and I have lived yes. it in a very personal way, right? So I think with my creative writing, I wanted to go into the personal. So it is very much about colonialism, but it is how, you know, it is more about how we live it in our daily lives. And mm -hmm. then I think the last thing I'll add to that is because it's so personal, because it's so much part of our daily life, of, of, of our quotidian life, there's a way in which, for me, everyday objects can sort of record that history. I love that, especially about your writing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, you know, yeah, tea is such an important part of Mauritian culture, <laughs> right? Um, and we enjoy it and we don't think about it too much. Um, there's a lot of pleasure in it, but it also comes from a painful colonial history with tea plantations. So I think that contradiction, I just wanted my story to hold that. And at the same time, I think, you know, in terms of archive and history, we think about those things in a certain kind of way, right? We think of writing, we think of libraries. But I think there were so many daily things. There, there were landscapes. Uh, there's like, I don't know, food culture that can also mm -hmm. hold, that can also be a certain archive about a certain culture. So I think I'm also coming from, from, from there. I think especially in the way that your protagonist moves. And so the, the idea of the tea making ritual or the ingredients is moving with her. There's a very beautiful sentence I wrote down where you write, her grandmother's passing had emptied her heart of home. And that made me so beautiful. And it made me think of, um, like, you know, like the emptying of a tea caddy as well. What do you do when the tea you brought with you is already gone and all of those things. So I think that that, that setting history and memory within the quotidian is incredibly powerful because of its universality, mm. really. And... Um, I have one more question, but the question is for for both for both you and and for Portia. So I'd like to invite you to read before we go on to that last question. Would you read for us a little bit, please? Of course. Um, so my story's title is Dite, uh, which means tea, uh, the tea we drink um, in in my native language, in Creole Mauritien. Um, so the passage I'm about to read is, is also about tea. Um, Durga had moved from island to island, up socially and away from familiarity, discarding everything except for her journals and us, her teas. She started writing as a teenager and kept the habit well into adulthood. Her journals recorded her life, and so did we. But the carefully constructed narratives, which Durga wrote in impeccable French and interpersed with exciting milestones, were not for us. Our domain is smells and associations, the quotidian and the transient. As we punctuate frantic mornings and lazy afternoons, day after day, we modestly gather in aromatic interstices between our leaves, the quiet intimacies of humans. We are no different from a beloved fruit from childhood, an old wooden toy or the last song on a mixtape, lost and found again. We are easily forgotten, that is, until we remember. Really beautiful. Do you think, um, Rina, that there's something about 
being an island person that influences your writing? <laughs> um, that's a good question. You know, I, I feel very much like an islander. I never thought whether it influences my writing. I did finish the story when I was writing it while sitting yes. in front of the ocean. I don't know if it influences the topic per se, except the fact that, you know, this is set in Mauritius, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as Durga sort of progresses, right, in social mobility, she goes from Mauritius to Manhattan to mm -hmm. um, an island in Massachusetts. And islands in Massachusetts are known playgrounds for the, for the rich, right? Um, I, you know, I think with this story, I was thinking of, different islands and how they could know different things, right? Manhattan is as much of an island as Mauritius is, but Mauritius is associated with, you know, tropical vacation, places where, you know, people are sort of like the decor in the background, right? Vacation yeah, spots yeah. where you go to, yeah, yeah. Right? That's all the thing. And Manhattan is, a com you have a completely different image, right? Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about the differences between islands uh, in that way. But in terms of influence, I think it might, it might, this is, um, I, I've never thought of it before very deeply, but I think there's something to it where the, the rhythm of water or the sound of water sort of influences my cadence a little bit. Yes. It adds that musicality, I think, to my writing, if I may say so myself. Um, no, so, I, I think yeah. that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and one can hear it in island accents around the world as well. It's, it's mm -hmm. almost as if that constant rhythm. Um, Portia, I want to ask you the same question about um, being an island person writer. Um, does anything that Rina is saying resonate with you? Well, um, immediately the whole association with the Caribbean, the Caribbean islands, um, just being a tourist spot. And yeah, definitely we, the inhabitants, are the deco or the background. Sometimes they really do um, feel like that. Um, with being on an island, influencing writing, I think Trinidad and Tobago, well, Trinidad is kind of very different and unique because, and I'm going to just assume it's because of the oil and gas, um, there are some parts of Trinidad that feel like very high like you know very very city and then there are some parts that feel totally cut off very rural um like the roads are really terrible and and all of that and the thing about for me living on an island and writing is that we can drive for like an hour or two and we could be in a totally different space we could be in a seaside space we could be in a rainforest space we could be in a cocoa estate space and then again yeah the cities um that is just from me as a girl growing up in um in central and um because we call it the west we have central and we have south um but it's so strange that it Canada in particular is just so divided um and we have like a lot of um issues uh, even though we're multicultural, a lot of issues more with class and I would say like colorism. And it's in that I would say influences my writing because of the environments I grew up in and the experiences I had. And uh, it may not play out in this piece in particular, but in other pieces. And just sort of wading through those experiences and putting it down on the page have been important for me and sort of understanding my country. Mm, well, it's interesting that both you and Rina talk about class, and that again makes me think about sort of an historical legacy. Um, Portia, would you read to us a little bit from The Devil's Son? Yeah, I know. Sorry, my own tablet is tablet thing. So I'll just read from the beginning, um, which I, I actually really enjoy. The Devil's Son. 
After hearing a phrase of music, memory suddenly rises in front of you like the clearing mist of the blue northern range. The heavy smoke of pitch oil flambeau, the smell of rain on warm asphalt in the night, the wail of your father, the silence of your mother. Some nights you will not forget, even though you feel you bury it deep enough is a brand to the back of your skull, somehow still burning, still on fire, hiding up in layers of flesh, follicles, a web of nerves. Then suddenly, it come back to malign your mind with misery and guilt. It's like that for me now, stick up in traffic on the way to San Fernando, and a station start to play a song that feel like a knife plunge in my belly. Me I know what old time this jockey dig up this old time song from my youth. Gucci Grants the Wayward Wind. The song is a pull to my navel string. The way eating the flesh of the armored cascadura does call you to come back home to die in Trinidad. That song pull my soul back to Shagonas. Old Shagonas from 60 years back a flood of memories erupting and fighting for the spotlight in my mind, the smell of burning sugar cane and rotten bagasse, that scent like festering flesh, the splash of cold water from a gleaming copper basin on the days that boiled us in sweat, roaming through the rows of Woodford Lodge Estate looking for adventure, the sizzling crack of a film projector the unnatural firmness and coolness of the Anglican Cemetery. Thank you. That's gorgeous reading. Thank you so much. I can see why you enjoy that. Um, Pip, I'd like to move on to you now and your, your story, um, A River, Then the Road. Um, starting off to say that for me, this story was immediately accessible. I was right in there from the first sentence. Um, it's really powerfully characterized, um, e even in this short format. I, d I don't understand how you packed in so much character in, in a short story. I felt that that was incredibly well done. This is another story about parenting, but now we're looking at a father and mm -hmm. and his children. Um, I think that I thought that you you accessed the the girl and her state of mind really brilliantly and with great subtlety. And I just wanted you to start off by talking to us about this particular family dynamic, because it's not one that, you know, I, like most of you, read a lot, but that story of fathers and their children, it's not one you read as often as you do mothers and their children. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you wanted to explore with that particular dynamic and their circumstances? Sure thing. Thank you very much. Um, I think a little, little bit like Sanjana, I'm uh, really fascinated by dysfunction in relationships. And um, I don't often write from the point of view of a child. This is probably as young a protagonist as I've, as I've ever had, 12-year-old Alexis in the story. Um, and I was particularly interested in, in her situation of being um, at a time of change in her life where she's becoming more sort of responsible for the adults around her and their failings. And also um, physically, she's at a time of, of great change. Um, so I think, I think the sort of decisions to, um, to centre it around the relationship with her father were partly because I wanted her to be um, isolated and maybe not to have her, her mother close to her at this in this particular situation that mm. she's in um um I really I'm really pleased with your um with your words that you found um you know you you responded well to her I I really try to write from sort of as, as deep within the skin of the character um mm. and I'm clearly not a 12 year old girl anymore so um it took quite a long time it was a slow story to write <laughs> as I really I was getting sort of deeper and deeper and deeper within her as I wrote version after version of the story. What were some of the other challenges? Because you don't only get into her skin, but in the last paragraph, 
which I don't think I'm ever going to forget. There's a there's a way that you offer. It's not necessarily redemption, but there's something about this one is not for you. I nothing to do with Commonwealth Righteous, but I watched lots of crime TV shows. And I realized recently that I had to stop because most of the murdered people were women. And mm. you offer a protection for your character. I, I won't spoil it because I want everyone to read the story. But you offer this protection of your character that I felt was really true. But it meant that you had to get inside the head of a non-human creature um, in order to do it. And you only give yourself a paragraph to do it. And yet here I am telling you, I will never forget that. Tell us about that. How did it come about? Why was it important to you? Um. In some ways, it was because I felt there was nowhere else that I could go from within the point of view of um, of Alexis anymore. I'd sort of come to to the end of where I could keep telling her story. Um, and um, in some ways, the decision for that shift in perspective was, was because I have two dogs and they sit very close to me all the time while I write. So they're a kind of a, I guess, um, something I like- I have a, one um, just over there. <laughs> Yeah, and um, and um, I, I'm I feel deeply connected to 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 my dogs, and um, but at the same time, I realise that a lot of that is my own projection, and um, I kind of like the arbitrary nature of our relationship with dogs that we're projecting onto them, and we um, are kind of possibly attributing sort of care or malice or a whole range of things that who, who knows what they're actually feeling so um yeah it was it was a chance to sort of delve into that relationship and see see what would happen if I was in the in the skin of that character so to speak yeah yeah I it, it could be that I'm a fellow dog person but that really spoke to me there's a a great vulnerability in all of the characters but also in the situation and, and it does make me want to move back to Julia because um Julia I just wanted to talk about this the 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 destruction that you you write about and I felt um in your story um what burns I felt frightened but I didn't feel despondent and as Pip's story also gives this possibility of kind of redemption or protection at the end I wondered if for you I my last note on your story Julia is and yet after the fire life returns can you just talk to us a little bit about that in, in the same spirit as we're talking about Pip's moment of redemption in her story mm, thank you um, I think the the Im I wanted to to put a positive image in all the story. And it was mm -hmm. when I saw the cremation of that woman and I saw those glowing red bones, it had also, a, a, it left a great impression on me. And I, and I said to myself, when I saw these red bones of that woman, I said to myself, well, if I finish like that, I'm okay with it because it was so poetic. This image was so strong for me. Mm -hmm. All this life that was there in those red bones. So I wanted to put at the center of the of this story, this, for me, this strong image of renewal. And of course, finish with the last image where, as you said, as everything um, after after the fire, everything um, grows again from mm -hmm. the fire because of the fire. So it was, yeah. yeah, I wanted to finish on that strong image. Can you read for us for a little bit? Yes, of course. So I, I'll just read the beginning of the story. So the title is French is Ce qui brûle. And in English, the title is What Burns. So this is the beginning. First burns the boreal forest up in the north. A little south of that burns the woman. Around her burn a turtoise, a pair of Siamese cats, two cage birds, a dozen mice, and seven other people whom misfortune trapped inside the 19th century heritage building. 
What a tragedy. Eventually, the building collapses on itself. Oof. Oh, and don't forget what's burned for decades. What's still burning? What will burn? All the oil, the coal, the gas. What else? Other than Dora, who will burn sometime around noon to much less fanfare. Fun fun With help from who will lovingly slide Dora into the oven when the time comes. Thank you so much. Um, what was the experience of being translated? Did you enjoy well, it? <laughs> in fact, I must say, um, it is, when I read it in English, it's like it's another story for me. But this translation is so perfect. It's, I, I know it's my words, but it's also Aria's words. So it's, we're, both of us in that all adventure, I feel like it because um, uh, even if, if if it's my if if those are my words, um, there are also hers. So, yeah, that's a beautiful way to put it. Um, Pip, I just want to come come back to you in, in advance of your reading because we were talking about these vulnerabilities, but one of the things that struck me about your story was um there's a physicality in the descriptions you give so I was in the car I was in the in the in the forest or wherever you wanted to, to take us and I just wondered how important that is for you as an aspect of characterization almost as considering place as another character is that something that you you've thought about um, yes, and New Zealand Aotearoa is another island nation, um, mm -hmm. not uh, necessarily a, a tropical one like um, some of the other writers, but um, it's, uh, I feel like wherever you are in this country, the um, the natural environment is um, either not far away or sort of in encroaching on, um, on, the, on the cities. Um, so where I live, even though I live in the capital city, um, there are beaches in walking distance and there are mountains in walking distance and there's native regenerating forest um, moments from my house. So um, it definitely is part of how I write and what I write. Um, I do think of it as another another character in, um, in the stories and... Um, Possibly in, in a similar way to the way I think about dogs and animals, I think that the natural environment, um, I don't think it's necessarily here to care for us. And I don't think it's necessarily necessarily here to harm us. I think um, our relationship with it is, is in some ways quite arbitrary. Um, mm -hmm. And so that also plays out in, um, in this story where... Um, yeah, the Alexis finds herself in a situation where maybe her her instinct is no help to her, or her lack of instinct um, is not sort of aided by the natural environment. Yeah, yeah, and yet everything that's happening is so deeply connected to that natural environment. Would you read a little bit from your story for us? Sure thing. Um, uh, so just some context: Alexis and her brother are visiting her father for the weekend in a small town a little way away from where they normally live. Alexis walked through the mall. Her parents had met here, working at shops that didn't exist anymore, her mum an apprentice at the hair salon, her dad at the butchers, both just out of school, only six years older than Alexis. All her mother ever said about that time was that they were way too young. In the bathroom, the air thick with pine air freshener, not quite masking the other smells, Alexis twisted the lock and um, the lock closed and sat down. There was a reddish smudge in her underpants. She wiped herself and there were more streaks of red on the paper. It was her first time. She knew what it was from her mum and from a session at school where boys had been ushered out of the classroom and girls were shown diagrams about how to use tampons and pads. Not many people in her class had their period yet or had admitted to having it. They had all been told it was natural and normal and nothing to be ashamed of. But boys playing lunchtime cricket at school had found a tampon once and took turns throwing the little white bullet at each other, full of derision and disgust. Accusations had circled about whose pocket it had dropped from. 
Alexis had been mentioned, and like everyone else, she had denied it. No way, as if, but she felt tainted all the same. She folded toilet paper into a wad and put it in her underpants, hoping it would last the couple of hours until she was home. Beautifully done. Um, now a general question for, for everybody. I... I think one of the things I love particularly about this prize is that you sit down for an afternoon and you have five stories and you've taken a journey around the world. And it's quite an intimate journey, at least for me as a reader. Um, and then I think about the format as in you have very little space in which to not only create this world, but in entering the competition, you're asking people who are not of the world to engage with you as well. And, um, Sanjina, I wanted to start with you and just talk to us a little bit about the short story format, your own feelings about it, your experiences with it, and what you think it allows you to do that maybe other forms or approaches may not allow you to do. Yeah, I I love the short story form. It's what I've spent the last three years writing, and I think I find it very productive to have the constraint of space to to be able to move someone in that in that little amount of time or space um i think a short story is is an investment which asks not too much of you but can give you a lot as a reader mm -hmm. um and i i love reading short stories myself and so writing them has been just a pleasure i do think that there is there is some sense of um of accessibility there's a question of accessibility when it comes to the work like you were saying because you're entering this limited world and you don't have everything um and you're expected to kind of go along for the journey i think i've grown very comfortable with the idea of my work having different levels of access for people um, oh that's yeah yeah i i knew with this story for example with the title being eshwari rai that's a name that I think a lot of people know, but definitely not everyone. Um, and even with having her presence in the story, I definitely got feedback from from people who wondered if I needed to explain who she was, or I needed to take her out, or I needed to provide additional, you know, explanation for for readers who might be unfamiliar with her. And I think I've always pushed back against that instinct. I think if you're writing, if you're trying to write for everyone, then I just, I don't think that you're writing um, an effective story. I think the more specific um, your work is, the more the more of a chance you have of it reaching people and touching people. And so I, I've grown very comfortable with the idea that with the short story, especially, you have to be okay with different people getting different things from the story and people getting more and people getting less out of out of what you write. I love that multiple levels of access. And what I love even more is that you push back, keep doing that, because um, people who don't know her will look her up. There is Google and their lives will be enriched. So mm -hmm. I'm really happy you didn't listen. Um, Rena, thinking about the, these different levels of accessibility, you mentioned your work as an academic yeah. as well. And I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about you know, if you have this outlet as an academic to research, study, and write about things that are important to you, why did you need fiction as well? And why the short story? What did you need to say that could only be said in this form? Um, I think it's 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 funny that we are talking about accessibility. I think there's a way in which academic jargon can be so inac inaccessible, right? And um, I think when I wrote my thesis, for instance, my PhD thesis, if you read it, it's quite inaccessible. Now that I'm turning it into a book, as academics are supposed to, I'm thinking a lot about that. I want more people to be able to read it. I want my family to be able to read what I wrote and understand. Um, at least you know what I'm trying to say. So it's it's interesting that in that way, right, with my academic writing, I'm striving for accessibility. And then in my fiction, I don't care at all. <laughs> I just write what I write. I write of my world. And, you know, again, as a, as a, as a student of literature, I've had to read 
so many, well, in my field, French books, Franco-French books, right? Um, that are deemed to be universal, to be canonical. But for me, who comes from a completely different place, I've had to work a lot to access these texts at the beginning, right? Um, there's a lot of work I've had to do. There's a lot of things I assumed, or I worked with the text, tried to understand it. And I think with my own fiction, I'm taking my revenge. Now it's time for other people to work at understanding my culture, right? My country, my setting. There's that. And I also think, you know, my scholarship and my creative writing are not so separate. I think I was talking about the mantle of objectivity earlier. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to bring the more personal into my academic writing. And I'm also trying to bring more of my research or more maybe explanations going against the adage of, you know, uh, show, don't tell. I, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. I want to tell mm -hmm. <laughs> into, into, into my fiction. So I think uh, in a way they are not so, they're not so separate. Not so separate. That's really interesting. And, and that show, don't tell, I think it's also very culturally specific because there are some storytelling traditions that are declamatory and you, you have to be sort of, you know, telling it out loud. And I think one of the things I appreciated about your writing, but certainly about all of the stories, is that very kind of, you all had a very distinct approach. Um, I'd like to, to move um, back to you, Portia and and the Devil's Son, speaking again about the short story. You've you've talked really sort of beautifully about the the different cultures that have influenced you and the things that are important to you. Do you feel like, as much as you'd love short stories, this is your format, or can you foresee a moment when you'll need something else, or is a short story always enough? Well, um, for me, it's mostly um short stories and poetry. Um, mm. I write a lot of poetry just from experience I might have had, or just something I saw, things like that. Um, just observations. And interestingly enough, I've noticed that the poetry feeds into the short stories. Um, because the poems that I write. Are like small stories in in their own way, uh, and like moving on to I guess like novels or things like that. Um, it just seems so daunting uh, to to have like an entire plot and you know everything is moving and interesting and and the different characters who come in and out. But uh, in my mind, I wouldn't mind doing um where they do interconnected short stories because I feel as though these little moments that you experience, they can be like short stories in 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 the plot of a novel and just having it interconnected in that way. So I would probably do something like that. But for now, I really enjoy the short story because as Sanjana was saying, it's like the accessibility is there as well and also as what um Rena was saying I like integrating a sort of academic part of it because there's a lot of history that I put into my short stories um a lot of interviewing like my parents or doing research into a lot of history books that we have there's one prolific writer we have um Anthony Devatile He's a priest, I think he's in his 90s, and he has written so many factual um, history books about Trinidad, about estates, about things we didn't learn in, you know, going to school. And there's one, um, there's one part to, he talks about the Jose massacre, which I didn't learn about in school, and I want to write about that. So it's just, it's very accessible to write all the little ideas I have in the short story. But, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, moving on to you, Julie. What are what are your feelings about the short story? But I found um what Burns to be very kind of filmic, cinematic. It was a very visual 
short story for me, which I think can be quite hard to achieve when you only have a limited space. So can you talk to us a little bit about why you choose this form and, you know, what, how you feel about short stories in general, what they can do for you as a writer with something you want to say, but also for me as a reader who's who's curious about where you're coming from? For me as a writer, I have to um, take an image. And this image is from um, author Julio Cortazar. And he was, he, he, he wrote both short stories and um, novels. And he, he was saying short stories like a, a sphere, like a circle, and a novel is like a tree. Hmm. And... I like this image because I feel good in that sphere. I really feel good in that. And since I'm really a slow writer, I'm obsessive with the form, with the words, with the sentence. So I think it doesn't fit that good with the novel because I, I couldn't, I, I think it would, be hard to have a 400 page with all the this intensity as in a short story of two or three thousand words you can get i think that intensity and mm -hmm. ask it from the reader to so I, I for me the short story is really the form i like and and the form i'm good in that sphere yeah, I, I like that what you're saying about that that level of intensity because you're right. I think that as a reader, I would have not necessarily I would have continued to be intrigued by your language, but it felt compact enough that I could digest the ideas and think about them without being overwhelmed. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, Pip, talk to us about the short story. I, um. I, I felt at the end of your story, and this is this is not something that I usually say to short story writers. This is incredibly unhelpful, so forgive me. But I did want to turn the page and find the next <laughs> one. And you chose an amazing moment to stop the story. And so, can you talk to us a little bit about the decision, the the, the decisions you had to make as a writer to to fit this this compact form? Sure. Um, I'm a I'm a big champion of the short story. It's just my absolute favourite form to um, to read, and so um, it's natural that that's what I try to write as well. Um, I think where to start and where to end a story is is one of the big decisions when you're writing short stories, um, mm -hmm. and I think one of the um, one of the beauties of the form is that you you're really inviting a reader into I think quite a concentrated experience and um, and I don't think we need to have everything resolved. I also I don't think novels, by the way, need to resolve everything. And sometimes I think it it can actually be disappointing when they do try to do that. Um, but I think um, with short stories in particular, there's um, an opportunity to leave on an ambiguous or an open-ended note, which um, I really enjoy as I really enjoy as a reader. I feel like it's um, it's putting a lot of trust and um, I get you know giving giving your reader the credit to then take the story in their own mind um, yes. where they want to take it to draw their own conclusions. Um, so I I enjoy that ambiguity um, and mm. I think. Um, the five stories on the shortlist are such a, a great kind of representation of the different things that short stories can do. There's such a different, um, you know, each one is different to the other in terms of its kind of voice and form and um, perspective. Um, so it was fantastic reading them all and thinking, um, you know, the diversity of the form uh, is, is alive and well. <laughs> it's true. And in each case, each one of you approaches the short story in a very different way, which I guess leads me to my final question, um, which is one that is purposefully difficult. So when I sat down to read the stories, I knew I was going to take a journey around the world. The thing that unites the stories is this idea of Commonwealth. 
Now, um, there, there are just so many political things around how we view Commonwealth. But for me, when I then think I may not have made these connections with such a disparate number of, of writers or such different kinds of writers without this idea of a Commonwealth that brings us together. So I just wanted to ask each and every one of you what this particular prize means to you and to to give some idea of, you know, in the context of having been regional winners, um, what does Commonwealth then mean? And, and is this one of the ways that it can continue to be valuable um, as well? Pip, I'm going to invite you to answer the question first and then we'll go backwards. Sure. Um, it is a hard question to answer. Um, I think for, for me, winning the Pacific region um, was an absolute honour. And I'm just, I think, the opportunity to have my story and my part of the world um, showcased alongside um, not just the other four stories um, uh, who were also winners, but but the shortlist as well. I think it's... Um, I think it's just uh, the diversity and um, the kind of openings that it gives to stories that I might not otherwise read um, has been has been fantastic, and mm -hmm. I I hope it continues. Um, even as you say, as possibly some of the other sort of political or economic or cultural links between what what a Commonwealth is, maybe they um, they change over time, um, but I think the um, the diversity and um, uh, the multiplicity of voices, I think, is yeah. is a great strength of this competition. But also the surprising interconnectedness in terms of theme as well is, is interesting to me. Um, Sunjana, can you talk to us a little bit just in response, either in response to Pip or in response to my question around Commonwealth and, and what that means for you as a writer? Yeah, I think that I've often, some of the other writing advice that I feel is commonly given to people in addition to show, don't tell, um, is to avoid referencing, you know, pop culture in your stories because it dates your stories. It makes them of a specific time in a specific place. And that is, again, something that I, I tend to push back on because writing is of a specific time in a specific place. Everything I write um, has a context and that's why I think the prize is is such a wonderful opportunity because it it the prize tells gives you permission to write from a specific place a specific time it gives you permission to put your positionality as the writer kind of front and center um, which I think is really wonderful and I and then I think it's really wonderful to be able to meet so many amazing people um, I'm connected with some some people on Twitter now and some people on Instagram and yeah uh, it's just lovely I I would never have had the chance to meet any of you um, without this and I feel so Perfect. lucky and grateful yeah. to, to be a part um, of this community. Yeah. That, that, that bringing together is is really important. Julie what is it like for you thinking about Commonwealth because you are only writer who is in translation and so there's there's the kind of like I guess a slightly different experience for you for you. But um can you talk to us a little bit about that that sense of writing from a certain place but also being involved in a in a such a wide range of, of voices for you as a writer who writes originally in French? Yes. Of course, um writing being translated sort of opens up the audience for me. Uh, I would never have dreamt of that. It, it's the first time I'm, I'm translated. So it's um, it's a great honor, first of all. <laughs> but uh, it's also quite a challenge for me because I have to speak in English now. So it's, it's um, yeah, it, it's been a, a little bit of a challenge, though, but I liked it. <laughs> and um, it was so great to be connected, uh, as Pip said and Sanjana said, to, to the others from all, the world, all around the world. I think um, the loneliness we can, we can um, live while writing sort of opens now with with all this um since a couple of of weeks since we've been finalists and 
So it was a, a really intense and really great experience. Wonderful. Um, Rina, I'm really interested in some of the work that you've mentioned as an academic, and I wonder how and I wonder how it touches on this idea of what is the Commonwealth. But I wonder if you could respond to that question, both sort of, I guess, with I don't know, your your academic hat on, but mostly as a writer of, of fiction and, and and what then this this prize means to you. Yeah, um, you know, it occurs to me as I was talking about tea earlier, right? I was saying how tea or goods like sugar or coffee, they come from this very violent history of plantation. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we take, you know, we take we take pleasure out of them, right? Um I would say, I would say the Commonwealth uh, and, and the Francophonie, right, um, which is which 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 is something that that stemmed out of the French Empire. It's a little bit the same thing, you know. They come from a violent history. Let's not forget that. But at the same time, I think they bring people together in an amazing way, right? Um, the fact that I speak French, with which I, you know, I have a very ambivalent relationship to to that language. But it allows me to talk to, you know, fellow Africans, right, uh, who also have that history. So I think in terms of the Commonwealth Short Story Prize, it's the same thing. And, you know, speaking of accessibility, I think one of the reasons I also felt more comfortable submitting my story to this prize and being as obscure about where I was writing from is because I think people who are judging the story, people who are reading the story are from everywhere. Right. And uh, or are from multiple places at once. Uh, and I think there's a there's a there's a sort of ease between maybe me and the reader that I wouldn't have with um, a cohort of less internet, you know, international uh, readers mm -hmm. and just that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to close, first of all, by thanking each and every one of you for um, inviting me into your world as a reader and for such a, it was pretty intense reading them back to back. I have to say I had a nap afterwards. I want to encourage everyone in the audience to access these wonderful stories and, and work by these writers. And huge congratulations to you all. And um, congratulations to my comrades at the Commonwealth Writers Prize for, I think this is the 12th year of the prize. Um, so entering teenagehood in the best possible way. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining me, for being so generous with your answers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.